Hey guys, Kevin here. I wanted to share with you a new development with the podcast. It is coming to you from a new podcast hosting service, Anchor.fm. So far, I'm really impressed. I really like it. Uh, Number one, it's free, which is always great. It's also integrated with Spotify and offers some great analytics on who's listening. Helps me gain some insight into what content would be good for the audience. And you can also record from your phone which is a nice new feature that I'm using right now. So if you have a podcast or you're interested in starting one, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast Bringing you strange but true things from the past It's not the average history that you learned in school We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools Them stories that are just too Paul Craddock, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Kevin. How are you today, sir? How are things in the UK? Things of you well, it's an election day today, local elections. Um, so I think I think things are okay, if a little tense in places. I'm sure. I'm sure. We just had that a couple of days ago ourselves. <laughs> it is the season. It is. Uh, so uh, you are a uh, first-time guest to the podcast, so uh, if you could please tell us a little bit uh, about who you are. I'm Paul Craddock. I am a medical historian, and my first book, Spare Parts, The Story of Medicine Through the History of Transplant Surgery, is about to be released in the U.S., in North America. Best title for a book I think I've had on the <laughs> Spare Parts. <laughs> It wasn't always called Spare Parts, actually. It was. It used to be called, it's real title, and I think you might be the first person to, I've actually told this to, <laughs> um, the, the original title was Dragon in a Suitcase. Dragon in a Suitcase? Yeah, and the fact you said it like that means I have to explain what that is. Um, and basically it's an yeah. 18th century story about about transplant surgery because transplant surgery goes way way back right. uh, but it was it was you know it was quite um quite a turning point of the 18th century and i found a story about basically the story is about a dragon um that is brought into britain and reanimated and the story includes uh, some forgotten 18th century science about how transplant surgery works. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact I have to explain that now means it was a very good thing. My editor said, you don't want to call your book Dragon in a Suitcase <laughs> because you'll be explaining that for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think is, this is perhaps a case where the, the editor had a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's um, had many good points, let me tell you. This is your first book. It is, yes. Yeah. Very good. Uh, how long have you been studying uh, the history of medicine? Ooh, well, the history of, well, I started studying the history of medicine because of transplant surgery. And that was in 2009, I started studying that. So quite a while, actually. I came across an image one day on the internet, as you do. I was looking for a subject for my PhD Um because I knew I wanted to study the history of medicine, but I didn't know quite what. Um, I was interested in the body and um, the history of the body. But, you know, that's really quite general. Um, but I was surfing the web, as they used to say. <laughs> and I came across an image of a woman called Jennifer Sutton. And she was staring at her own heart. And this was an image that was taken at... Uh, a museum which was new at the time um, called the Welcome Collection. The Welcome Trust has been going for a long time, but the Welcome Collection was a new museum, public facing mm-hmm. um, institution and library. And it was their first temporary exhibition on the heart. And one of their main exhibits was a human heart that had been excised as part of a, a transplant procedure. And they invited uh, the woman who'd received the transplant to come and look at it and there was a photographer there to, to view it so if you if you google anybody listening to this now you can google jennifer sutton and Hart, and it'll come right up 
um, and it's it's a spine chilling image. What a surreal! It's absolutely. But looking at that image, it's well a few things immediately occurred to me. One of them was, I suppose, a general sort of. Uh, it sounds quite saccharine to say it, but a general kind of thankfulness for our health service. You know, we have a national health service, and without that, uh, Jennifer wouldn't have been able to to be looking at her own heart. So there's that kind of uh, thankfulness there, I suppose you could say. But also, it was incredibly, as you can imagine, and hopefully if you searched it, <laughs> intimate. Because you have this woman looking at, at her own heart and there's nothing more intimate you can't get much more intimate than that right um and you also have the added knowledge that inside of this woman is someone else's heart and someone had to die for that picture to be even possible to keep her alive to keep her alive in order to make that picture well not in order to make that picture possible but you know what i mean yeah um and it's this general i suppose the image being so such an unlikely one, it raises all sorts of questions about um, the body. What does it mean to have a body? Who owns the body? Um, what is it to have an identity? And how has that? How does that change when you have someone else's parts inside of you? Um, so it, it so transplant surgery sort of quite quickly emerged for me as a topic of human interest so i wasn't i'm not a surgeon at all yeah. um i'm i've never had a transplant i donate blood um but that's about it as far as my personal involvement with the field of transplantation goes but it's it's a subject that encourages you and invites you to think about um the big questions in life and that is why I decided to dedicate the next 11, 12 years to the subject. I'm very excited to have this conversation today because you're, I mean, we're going to get into, I'm sure, you know, topics, you already mentioned identity and then morality and philosophy mm -hmm. and probably religion, uh, all society, all kinds of things. This is, this is going to be a good conversation. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> in your research, when, when did we first start doing this type of thing? It's not clear, and it's not clear because it's so ancient. It's In fact, transplant surgery is mentioned in the form of a skin graft in one of the earliest surgical texts that exist, and that's a Sushruta Samhita, um, an ancient Ayurvedic Indian uh, surgical text. And well it it was compiled between well i don't know exactly and no one really does but between the sixth century and the second century bc uh, but even then everything in that document uh, was considered traditional okay so we're talking several thousands of years we're talking at least at least a few thousand years um and it and it actually it it there's a lot of evidence that it comes from horticulture. Do you know how how um, farmers will graft trees together, apple trees, pear trees, to increase their yields and, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot? Well, the skin graft technique is that technique transposed from plants to humans. So somebody had the, the curiosity to at least say, well, if this works for plants, what if we try hmm. people? Absolutely, and, and and there are so many, I mean, if you read the book, you'll find out just how, not well, you won't find out just how many, but I indicate quite a few ways in which um, humans and trees had a kind of a, I, I want to say a kinship. I mean, I don't want it to sound too flaky, but you know, people had this idea that humans and trees were related quite closely. Pliny the Elder, for instance, um, said that trees had the equivalent of bones, the equivalent of blood, sap, you know, there are, there are um, correspondences there. Uh, but also culturally, people have treated trees quite similarly to humans. In India, for instance, um, certain 
uh, part, in certain parts of India, people would marry trees to one another to sanctify their crops. So okay. there are, you know, there are, there are, there are correspondences culturally and physiologically and transplant surgery, it seems emerged as one of those correspondences. Now you mentioned the, the earliest form of this being skin graft. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, maybe we should define when, when, when we talk about doing a transplant, what, what qualifies? Um, I've asked that. I've asked that question. Um, I've been asked that question quite a bit, actually. And it, it for me, it is when some some organism or some part of an organism is growing in one place, and then is uprooted from there and moved to another place. So that could be the same the same on the same body. It could be uh, from one body to another, but the character of it is is that it's growing. Excuse me. It's growing in one place and it is uprooted and planted again. So I, I would assume that this was probably relatively rare and didn't have a great success rate. It's hard to say in ancient India um, because we don't really have any records of operations taking place, of transport operations taking place at that time. We have the, you know, the, the the process described, but when it is described, it's described as one of the most prestigious processes a surgeon can perform. And if you were going to treat a king, you needed to be able to graft skin. So it had a kind of a, a cachet, I suppose you could say. Um, the members of the lower castes probably weren't having this type of thing done. Um, well, I suppose you'd have to practice on someone. <laughs> That's just my supposition. I, I... <laughs> That's oftentimes how uh, how uh, the research part goes. Well, do you know in the in the nineteenth century, the, the British, in inverted commas, discovered uh, this procedure, um, and it was being performed by a man of the brickmaker caste. So it, it had a particular, you know, a particular kind of a person would have performed it as well. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how common it, it it was, but it must have it must have been fairly common. Okay, all right. So when do we start seeing this uh, having better documentation of it? Well starts to sort of emerge in the records in about the 15th century but really the first sort of the start of the story the start of a story i tell um is 1549 and that's uh, in italy and a, so a few things have changed in that time as you can, as you can probably imagine but something fundamental has changed about the operation as well it's the procedure is pretty much the same, um, but it's it's not performed on kings anymore. It's not part of any any legitimate um, official rather system of medicine. It's performed exclusively by peasant families in Italy, and these peasant families they have their they have this technique as a secret, so they can perform it on people who come to them, but they don't want other people to know about it. But in 1549, um, a very interesting surgeon called Leonardo Fioravanti decided he would steal the technique. So he rocked up. Um, that that term "rocked up" didn't didn't slip off my tongue very easily. He. <laughs> <laughs> he went to uh, the door of one of these se secretive surgical families, the Vianio family, and he um, he asked him if he could watch them operate, because he had um, a relative, he said, who'd been fighting in Lombardy, and he'd lost his nose. Mm -hmm. So um, he he wants to get a replacement, but not quite sure how to go about it. Don't quite trust this this operation that he's heard so much about so can you watch it and they said yes and you know it's completely swallowed his story um and so he started watching this operation which i'll not describe because it's quite gruesome and bloody 
But he started to watch his operation and he put his hands up to his eyes as if he couldn't stand the sight of all this blood and it was making him feel queasy. Um, but what he was really doing was looking through the gaps in his splayed fingers. And he took note of everything they were doing and he wrote it down in his book. And that's how we get the first sort of... Um, well, it wasn't really codified, I don't suppose, at that point, but it was written up for the first time in uh, modern or early modern uh, literature. Fioravanti was a complete liar, though. So <laughs> he, he went, to, I think it was, I can't remember exactly now, but it was, I think it was Florence. Uh, it's in the book, but it, it was, he went to visit Florence and he went to the Hospital of the Incurables. And he reported on his visit there saying, I cured everybody. He just sort of <laughs> brazened it all out, you know. <laughs> right, right. It's a lot of exaggeration there. Exactly. And he, actually, he he tried out that, that um, procedure on his friend a year later. This is, again, this is a report that he made in, 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 in one of his books. He, he, he was wandering around the coast with his Spanish friend. And the Spanish and the Ottomans were at war at the time. Mm -hmm. And a fight was picked <laughs> and um, a nose was lopped off. And Fioravanti decided, um, well, I, can, I can reattach that nose for you. Uh, so it, it, it had sort of fallen off into the dirt. And he picked it up and he looked at it and it was full of sand and he urinated on it and decided then to put it onto his friend's face, tied a bandage around it, uh, like you would with a tree, you know, binding it tightly. And when he removed the bandage a few weeks later, nose was attached. Um, so I don't quite believe that story. The mechanism does work of skin grafting. It's the mechanism people still use. Mm -hmm. I don't quite believe that he reattached um, a nose after weeing on it <laughs> um, because he had form as a liar so I don't know. you can make your own mind up though, i suppose <laughs> <laughs> so when did they start going inside the body inside the body oh god it's actually hard to know what inside means does blood transfusion count Actually, that is the most internal transplant in this kind, in this long history of transplant surgery, because blood transfusion um, wasn't meant to transfuse blood itself. You know, if you lost a lot of blood now, you'd get a blood or a plasma transfusion and you would sort of replenish what you'd lost. Mm -hmm. Well, there was no concept uh, of, of a blood that needed to be replenished because in those days, if you um, went to the doctor to be treated for most ailments, as you will know, you were bled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so blood was meant to come out, not go, not, not go in. Yeah. <laughs> um, but something happened in, well, 1624 is when William Harvey published in Latin his ideas on the circulation of the blood. It's something he'd he'd um, lectured about before this point, but 1624 is when we sort of have that date, isn't it? Uh, of the discovery of blood transfusion, uh, blood um, circulation. And quite soon after that discovery, well, I should say first actually that, that the discovery of the circulation of blood um, is, the dis is the, I suppose, introduction of a new way of looking at bodies as not quite as machines but as being composed of mechanical components so you still have a the idea of a soul which inhabits this um body but um um you know you have the first sort of indications that the body is not not all that the ancients said it was it was something quite different um so it's there's a, there's a system and so and, and as soon as you have people identifying this system you have people thinking this mechanical system you have people thinking oh can we attach two systems together what happens if we do that uh, and and how do you in can you introduce things into that system so 
infusion experiments happened um, at the Royal Society in Britain, um, in London and Oxford. And they used hollowed out quills, hollowed out reeds, you know, any kind of conduit that they could get their hands on or, or contrive um, to try to introduce substances into the bloodstream to see what would happen. Mainly it was opium um, and alcohol and you'd, you'd try to get a dog drunk or high. And they get drunk and high very quickly if you inject <laughs> those things into really? their bloodstream. Yeah. <laughs> As you can imagine. And one of these scientists, Richard Lower, he decided to inject milk because could you feed a dog? Could you keep it alive by feeding it directly? Can you guess what happened? I don't know if I want to know. Well, what happens when you mix blood and milk is that it curdles. So that dog would have had a horrific death. Um, but then lower thought, what if you inject some blood? Because blood has already assimilated the food. So you might be able to keep an animal alive by injecting blood. So that was the sort of link to, to transfusion, to blood transfusion. Um, now when, so that's, that's one side, this sort of mechanical sort of contrivance, this mechanical conception of the body and how you connect to bodies. But people in this era don't really yet know very much about what the blood is, what's inside the blood. So they're relying on um, a mixture of ancient medicine, of folk belief, of religion, and they, <coughs> excuse me, and they tend to think that inside of a blood there is some kind of soul or some kind of humoral um, mixture, some kind of uh, bit of your personality even. So they would go to myths and legends like, um, you know, Ovid, they'd go to Ovid's stories and think of things like uh, Jason and the Argonauts, the story of Medea. Um, part of that story at the end involves um, Jason, he's, he's earned the Golden Fleece and he's on his way back and he's claimed Medea, who was the king's daughter. So he's on his way back home. And when he arrives there, all of his men's families are there celebrating and his own father is the only one who, who didn't who didn't come out because he's too old. So what Medea does at uh, Jason's request is she arranges for um, a, a, a potion to be made. Well, she makes the potion herself, a magical potion, and rejuvenates his blood with it. So she slits his throat, re mixes this potion with his blood and then puts it back into his veins. In some versions, he drinks it. Um, and the people who, the, the scientists in the, in the 17th century who thought about blood transfusion, um, thought about this as a kind of inspiration. Maybe if you transfuse the blood of a young animal, you can make an old animal younger. You can transfer that youth. Maybe if you transfuse the blood of a young animal into a human, you could make that human younger. But let's take it further. <laughs> Maybe if you transfuse the blood of a lamb, which is of course the lamb of God, it's innocent, it's uh, pure. If you transfuse that into an insane person, it would make them sane again. And you know what? It looked like it worked. Because you can take, your body can take a little bit of blood from well an incompatible source i wouldn't recommend trying it but it can take a tiny bit of blood from an incompatible source and you would be very ill you would be incredibly ill you would vomit you would you wouldn't have a very good time and you'd be too tired to act insane so they're interpreting this as it as a cure working mm. of course you'd recover eventually and then you'd need another another top up um, and eventually it would end in in your agonizing death <laughs> agonized death um but yes i suppose when you asked about um 
when transplant goes internal, I suppose you can't get much more internal than transplanting a soul or transplanting a bit of your personality. Hey guys, I want to say thank you for being a listener of this podcast. I hope you're enjoying it and that you're learning a lot. I wanted to take a moment to tell you about a way that you can support the podcast through the show's Patreon. Over at patreon.com, you can support the show for as little as a dollar a month. You can contribute whatever you feel the show is worth, and supporters get some extra perks, such as bonus Q&A episodes with some of my guests, uh, the opportunities to submit listener questions, and then supporters get early access to all episodes uh, about a week before anybody else. So if you're interested in supporting the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash cmtu history. One way you can support the podcast that is absolutely free is you can like the show on whatever app you like to listen to podcasts on, uh, write a little review. Those things are immensely helpful in getting the show some exposure to new listeners. Uh, You can also follow the show on social media. I am on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. All of them are at CMTU History. And one new development with the podcast is that the show is now on YouTube. I know that some people like to listen to podcasts on YouTube. Maybe they have it up uh, in the background while they're at work at their desk. Uh, So I'm working on making that available. I have a YouTube channel, CMTU History. Look for Can't Make This Up. And then I'm working on getting the back catalog of episodes up on there. Please bear with me. It's a a bit of a slow process, but I'm I'm working on it. Uh, And then, of course, please subscribe to the show on YouTube. That's something I'm trying to really build up uh, as kind of the next phase of the podcast. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Now back to our interview. Now, looking at the world in which these experiments in Europe are being conducted, I mean, it's, it's Christendom. It's, you know, highly religious. How, how do the religious authorities of the day interpret this type of um, meddling? Mm, mm. Well, it depended on the authorities in France, in Catholic France, it was an abomination because of course you are meddling with the soul you're in fact you're you're making something mechanical that wasn't meant to be mechanical you're you're saying you can split the soul and move it somewhere else and so many um doctors physicians um so many uh, early or proto scientists you might say um, wrote um, against blood transfusion. The in in France, the you know the chief scientists of the um, Academy of Sciences there, they were completely against blood transfusion. Um, in fact, <laughs> the person they got to to um, to investigate it uh, was called Claude Perrault. Now, my French is is appalling i'm so i apologize to anybody who can speak french uh claude perrault um and he he actually if you've heard his name you might have heard it as an architect part of the louvre the gallery uh, well gallery now isn't it um but he was also uh he was interested in medicine to begin with and his brother had what historians think was typhoid fever and he 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 you know, he thought being a traditional doctor, he thought that um, this was caused by him sleeping on a bed um, where his bed sheets had been dried too close to a rose bush. Because that would cool down, uh, it would it would have some kind of humoral effect, and it would it would change the um, composition of his humours. It would cool him down or heat him up or so I, I'm not quite sure how it worked in his mind but he, he he tried to treat it by putting a pigeon on top of his head a um, and, pigeon on top of his head and so the audience knows what we're talking about this humorous mm. idea um 
could you you know this idea of good humors and bad humors that what we're talking about um well humoralism is uh, an ancient way of conceiving body in sickness and health so your body is composed of four humors you have blood black bile yellow bile and phlegm and now if those are if there is a a, a balance between those four humors you are considered to be healthy if there's an imbalance in any one particular way there are many different diseases or or um upsets <laughs> that you might have um there those humors are for the most part invisible so there isn't it's not an empirical kind of medicine um, it relied a lot on the stars as well and you know deducing what a person's um state of health would be so so the person who the french authorities got to investigate blood transfusion was a committed humoralist he had been trained in very traditional ways um of medicine so they already had pre-decided pretty much that it wouldn't work and it was a terrible terrible um thing to do it was against the church oh. as well uh, in britain in protestant britain it was a very very different story plays were written about how ridiculous and hilarious this was to think of a, a, a scientist trying to um make uh to try to change someone's makeup by transfusing the blood of an animal so you had plays making fun of this you know, oh if you transfuse a a mountain goat's blood into me i can go and finish my collection of of bird eggs i can go up the mountains i can turn into a goat you know all so, kinds of so if i wanted to i i could get uh bear strength or something like that if I... exactly you're, you're catching on and you're already you're already coming up with your own possibilities i like this yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know scientists in the period were not respected figures they are now well mm -hmm that's actually debatable now but um they they certainly were not then so trans trans blood transfusion was in a similar category to things like weighing air which is something scientists at that time were were seemed to be obsessed with and it was it was a a a point that the public just protestant public in britain found hilarious they just couldn't get enough of making fun of scientists and so many plays were written about about how science was ridiculous and transfusion you know that 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 was one of those ridiculous um procedures experiments that they made fun of um otherwise there's very little actually in the way of a surprisingly little in the way of of overt religious um uh, uh condemnation of blood transfusion you have the catholic we we'll just discussed the catholic um response in france a one of fear because you are you're splitting souls but um surprisingly little actually and what about um I guess philosophers who you know they spend a lot of work you know there's been a lot written about the self and the psyche and who am i mm. uh, have they had anything to say about this about transplantation in general absolutely um i suppose this moves our conversation slightly on to tooth transplants but it would be good to sort of excuse me it would be good to introduce the great shift that took place in the 18th century and how uh, we had a very different idea of what a, a very different idea of what identity is or could be emerged in that period so the 18th century is really the birth of the modern world mm -hmm. you had high streets appearing you had fashion becoming a thing you had uh, christmas trees um <laughs> being um you know proliferating at christmas time in non-german households uh, you had coffee shops you had a new idea about identity um 
in the period we've just been talking about in the 17th century and before you had these notions of souls or these notions of some kind of animating principle um you were pretty much inside of your body you inhabited a body which is why blood transfusion is so troubling for catholics uh, particularly or was that <laughs> the kind of transfusion which we've just been talking about uh, was was troubling for catholics um and that's because you disturb that soul once you get to the 18th century you have different ways of thinking about identity emerging so instead of thinking about the self as something that inhabits the body now you think about or some philosophers started to suggest you might think about yourself as a composition so instead of being a thing that inhabits you are your body and that's all that you are so you are the result of the things that you buy the things that you own the things that people associate with you the things that are done to you the things that um you identify with so sci uh, historians of better call it individuations basically it's the more or less modern idea that you are an individual mm -hmm. so that comes um into into place in the 18th century and it's not immediate of course but you have that very very definite um shift from one way of looking at um the self in relation to the body to this more modern sense and that brings with it new kinds of transplant so we just talked about fashion well i've just mentioned fashion um and the high street and and this consumer revolution this industrial revolution that created new ways of being concerned over your appearance for instance because if you were going to get ahead in this new society and sort of de defeat as it were that that widening class divide maybe get on in life you wanted to present yourself well so dentistry appeared um in the early 18th century 1728 the word dentiste again that's my terrible french um that was coined by pierre fauchard and his approach to dealing with the teeth was or to treating the teeth was was a new one based on science based on um uh, based not on the removal uh, not necessarily just on the removal of a troublesome tooth uh, but on treating uh, troubles and teeth filling the teeth because it was was one of his item one of the items on his menus filing them washing your mouth out with urine to clean them that's something that we don't tend to do very much nowadays no, um no no i'm glad you said that <laughs> uh, <laughs> glad we we can we can confirm that um and transplanting teeth as well didn't really take off that much in the early part of a century later in the century when those forces of capitalism and social inequality became supercharged um you have a lot of satire about tooth transplants because the uh, writing uh, cartoons things like that because the the donors that's a very euphemistic way of using the term donor by the way the I, donors were little children okay for children poor children some of the early writers uh, some a, a dentist in yorkshire called charles allen in the, at the end of the 17th century said that you could you could it, it, that would be barbaric to take human teeth um better to use a, a sheep or a gorilla i don't know where you get a gorilla in eight in 17th century yorkshire but um it was obviously a more diverse <laughs> place than it is now <laughs> um yes but once you get to the 18th century you have you have that widening class system and you have rich people wanting to get ahead wanting to have beautiful mouths but rotting their teeth of course with the sugar and sweetmeats that they can now buy mm -hmm. um so money can solve everything let's just buy the tooth of that little girl whose whose family is starving mm. they'll appreciate the two guineas or whatever it would be 
Um, so that that's particularly barbaric. And it was, it was, it was, I don't think it was actually outlawed, you know, tooth transplantation. It's, it fizzled out start of the 19th century. The last reference I'd ever seen to a tooth transplant being formed was in Buffalo, New York. And it was 1837, but that was very much a, an outlier. It, by the year 1800, it pretty much stopped uh, as, a, as a practice. But I have seen it in a dentistry textbook from 1919. Okay, so as late as that, they're at least no. referencing it. Now, mm. now, can I assume once we begin to develop synthetic uh, alternatives for replacement teeth, that that's when this tends to fall out of favor? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Um, that and some of the wealthy recipients started to get syphilis and other infections and they started to become ill and some die, some high profile deaths. Mm -hmm. um, it just It's just generally safer to get a porcelain set of teeth. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and just the, um, uh, I don't know, knowledge of where your new tooth has come from. You know, I would much rather mm. have a fake tooth than knowing that it was someone else's tooth. That says you're a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Paul, uh, uh, your book is gross, a little bit icky, but it is amazing. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> no, this is um, a fascinating part of history that I always enjoy uh, diving into. I guess that makes me a little bit weird, but the... <laughs> Uh, the history of how we came to have modern medicine is so fascinating. It is. I've got to say, though, it's it's only gr it's not gross gratuitously. <laughs> <laughs> it's gross to bring those things to life. A writer has a responsibility not to write dryly, I think. Yes. And I, I don't I actually I don't I, I'm not particularly interested in gross things or grossing people out. Right. Well, well, Paul, uh, I, I've loved this discussion and I've loved hearing about your research. Uh, if someone is interested in science and medicine and history, uh, where can they go to pick up a copy of your book or to learn more about you and your other research? Oh, thanks, Kevin. It's, it's been wonderful to be a guest as well. Thanks for having me. Um, to get a copy of a book, it should be available wherever people get their books, usually. Um, and I have a website, which is www.paulcraddock.com, which is mostly about the book at the moment, uh, but I shall be further populating it uh, shortly. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks so much. Hey, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode and you liked my conversation with Paul Craddock. Uh, definitely a very interesting topic to get into. Uh, chit chatted with Paul a little bit before and after the show and, and just a really nice guy, really cool to talk to. Uh, so if you want to learn more uh, about the history of transplants, uh, his book again is Spare Parts, The Story of Medicine Through the History of Transplant Surgery. And I've included a link to the book uh, down in the description of this episode in your podcast app. So you can check that out. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Uh, it'll probably be sometime in June. And we'll be talking with Dean Job. He's been on the podcast before. He's a true crime author. Um, he's going to talk to us about a Victorian serial killer, the murderous Dr. Cream. Uh, so can't wait to get into that with Dean. Uh, in the meantime, you guys can check out uh, his past couple episodes on the podcast. Uh, until then, uh, have a great start to your summer.